Hey, welcome everyone. Welcome everyone, it's good to see you. Today is Wednesday, February the 10th, and this is our eighth day actually of the big read of solving the race issue in America. And uh, we're here with author, creative, uh, Herbert Harris. Greetings, Dr. Harris, how are you? I'm excellent today, and you? Well, well, we are joined again by two magnificent readers, including our repeat star excellence reader, Ariel Haynes, out of Ariel Payne from Florida A&M State University, and Ariel, a second year political science student there in Tallahassee, Florida. Greetings, Ariel. How are you today? Greetings, everyone. I am doing pretty well today. Um, as he said, I am Ariel Payne, a second year political science student um, at FAMU. I currently uh, live in Tallahassee still. That is my hometown. Um, I did want to correct you, uh, Dr. Rogers. You keep saying Florida State A&M University. I think you're doing it on purpose, actually, because you know I love my HBCU. Um, but yes, I do attend a Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University, and I love it. So, yeah. Yes, and... And maybe I'm needling you just a little bit because we just know a that little bit. we know that you rattlers strike and you strike and you strike again. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's wonderful to have you with us. We're listening forward to your voice and your insight in the comments once again. We're also being joined by Reverend Tori Haynes, and so the pain and the Hain, we have uh, uh, names that sound similar today. And uh, Reverend Tori Haynes has graduated from Shaw University as a presidential scholar, majoring in both religion and philosophy, and a minor in political science, again, at Shaw University. And he's exited with a 3.4 GPA, while also a member of Shaw's Honor College. So this is a distinguished scholar joining us today. He's a key servant at Rock Hill United Methodist Church under the dynamic leadership of the great pastor Shirley L. Canty at Rock Hill United Methodist Church. Their Fresh Expression Ministry, which provides outreach and a bridge between the church and the community. Uh, Tori Haynes plans to attend, he's actually attending Hood Theological Seminary and is pursuing his master's in divinity and theology. Greetings and welcome, Reverend Tory Haynes. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. And you said everything, so I don't have to, to say anything. <laughs> and I'm happy to be here today. Excellent. Well, we will begin with our reading. Uh, Dr. Harris, we're going to jump right into the text, if that's okay with you. Great. Can you start us off, Ariel? All right, we'll do. Okay. What about discipline? Prior to school desegregation, white schools and black schools use corporal punishment, spanking, etc. Usually in elementary and middle schools when students were between five and 12 years old. In many school systems, corporal punishment was generally endorsed prior to school desegregation. Once the public schools were integrated, corporal punishment began to disappear. Once again, the vision of a black American teacher spanking white American children was contrary to the paradigm of slavery. White teachers paid more than black teachers. One reason that white Americans resisted integration so violently was that in public school systems throughout the South, throughout the South white teachers were generally paid more than black teachers of comparable experience and education. In North Carolina, for example, interviews with retired Black teachers who had worked in the public school system before and after integration revealed that during the period of segregation, Black teachers and school administrators were paid at least 20% to 35% less than white teachers with comparable education and experience. This disparity in teacher pay again demonstrated that the separate but equal doctrine legitim legitimatized in 1896 by the United States Supreme Court 
in Plessy versus uh, Ferguson was in reality a legal cover for the uh, disparate, unequal, and unjust treatment of Black Americans on every level of American life. The real tragedy of this unjust situation was that once integration took place in North Carolina, the white American powers that controlled the state government did not immediately rectify the unfair difference between the salaries of black and white teachers. Instead of immediate action, the North Carolina state government adjusted the black teachers' salaries gradually over a period of at least three years. Can you imagine how black American teachers must have felt working side by side with white American teachers knowing that the white teacher is being paid more simply because he or she was white. Knowing that black teachers were paying the same, if not more for food, clothing, shelter, and other necessities of life than the white teachers, what moral justification could there be for continuing this uh, salary inequity for three and possibly more years? Where was the love of the white Christians and power for their fellow man? Had they again forgotten the golden rule? They were trapped in the confines of the paradigm of slavery. This is a very intense reading, Dr. Harris, that Ariel has given us when she's discussing, you know, discipline in schools, both during the time of segregation, if you will, and during the time of integration. What prompted you to um, interview those teachers and ask those questions? Well, you know, doc, my mother and my aunt were school teachers in the system. And they had so many uh, numerous practices like that. The segregated schools, I literally, my entire undergraduate, undergraduate, my high school from elementary through high school education was in segregated schools. And the teachers there were so dedicated that, you know, we did a, a program the other day and there were three things that teachers stressed hard work, excellence, and persistence to hang in there. And with that kind of context, you got a sense that the teachers really cared about you. When the integration came and they found that black teachers were paid 40% less than white teachers, many of the black teachers were, were it's almost like they knew it but you know, sometimes people don't want to admit it. They knew it, but they didn't want to acknowledge it. But the thing that really was amazing was the fact that once you found that, once it was recognized, two things. One, why was it okay? Why did the government, and we're talking about institutional systemic racism, why did the local board of education think that was all right? Why did the state legislatures think that was all right? And even more so, why did they then take five years <laughs> to rectify it? In other words, they didn't say, hey, we were wrong. Let's up these salaries immediately and rectify this. No, they took it over a five-year period. So it really showed something about our education system and the paradigm of the people who were running it. You know, many of the Southern schools in North Carolina and Wilmington they, the local leaders had to sue the Board of Education, even though Brown versus the Board of Education decision came down in 1954. Mm -hmm. The school system did not desegregate until 68, they began the process. So what, 14 years wow. later. And throughout the North Carolina and many states in the South, even though the court ruling came down, the local authorities would not enforce it. And Wilmington became very nationally known because of the Wilmington 10. The, the tension was so high in Wilmington that the Wilmington 10, uh, Ben Shavers, uh, uh, literally, and I think he was a member of the Congregational Church. Mm -hmm. The church, the Congregational Church was the church in which the Black students had to, had to hide to keep from being injured. The National Guard came, etc. And the Wilmington 10 came out of that where they literally chumped trumped up charges against 10 young men, one as young as I think 16, wow. along with Pastor Ben Shavers. And these, this case was so egregious that it's one of the few cases that Amnesty International came on board. These young men served at least five years in jail. 
Amnesty International came on to take it on. So what we're saying is when you had a, an education system that was racist at the core, that was unjust at the core, that the black teachers, the black principals still made it work. And still created that sense of excellence and still created students that were able to go and excel. I got a scholarship to go to an Ivy League school, Columbia. Another one of my class went to the uh, University of Pennsylvania. So even though the schools were segregated, even though we had secondhand books, we never got new books. Okay? Even though the teachers were paid less, still the excellence was there in the teaching and the, and the education that the students received. And, and what's interesting is that I entered school during the period of segregation. Now, up until kindergarten, I had gone to our church kindergarten. So I had African-American teachers and we were taught, you know, the Bible as well as how to care for ourselves and love each other. And in the integrated school system, it was a harbinger. It was a safe zone when we had an African-American instructor, an African-American teacher. And now the, 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 the elementary school I went to, they believed in corporal punishment. <laughs> and there were teachers that were known for giving, you know, strict corporal punishment. Yet upon reflection, I think it wasn't until, no, I was never, I was, I was never given a paddling by a white teacher. I was given a paddling by one black teacher who was also the president of our local chapter of the NAACP, which is interesting. I told him much later, hey man, you paddled me when I was little. He said, you probably deserved it. I don't think I did, but that's an interesting point. You, you said something earlier too, before we bring Ariel back to this conversation, you said yesterday that someone pointed out to you that if during integration, they had retained the black high schools and the black elementary schools, and they had bus white students across town to those institutions, how would that, you raised the question, how would that have changed people's mentality? Because then you would have had white teachers as well as white students under the leadership of African-American teachers and African-American principals. And you know, Dr. Rogers, that's a, a, a really a powerful statement. And I was doing a, a conference and the, the person who actually raised that question was a white person who had gone through the, he came into the integrated schools during the period of the riots and, and all of the, the challenges. He was there when the Wilmington 10 situation developed. Mm -hmm. And the racism again in America that we must confront, the idea of integration in white minds was that black schools were bad Black teachers were inferior. Black education was inferior. And so their interpretation of, of integration was to close down the Black schools, get rid of the Black teachers and principals. You know, we had a full, uh, full a cadre of Black teachers and principals. And now when you go into the public school system, you need a detective to find a Black teacher. Especially a Black male teacher. Exactly. And a black male teacher, you need two detectives and the FBI. Right, right, right. <laughs> and so this paradigm penetrated our school system so much that the the loss to the to the society is great because suppose they had taken that other approach where it was truly integration, where white schools and black schools and would would and the staffs would have integrated, then a major challenge could have been overcome, but there is a, uh, what is it, a quota. It says, a mind changed against its will is of the same opinion still. Yes. And so when you had the same people running the, the education systems who had to be sued to implement Brown versus the Board of Education, with them still in charge, they didn't have a moral capitulation overnight. Right. They implemented the integration in the same racist mindset that they implemented segregation. Got it. Yep. Our children suffered greatly about it. But, but, but look at the loss to the country. What if it had been impl implemented properly? What a great country we would have. Interesting. Ariel, what are your thoughts on your reading and how that squares or compares with 
even your experience in K through 12 uh, prior to coming to FAMU, if you will? Um, as I stated in the last session, I do believe that um, the American educational system fails um, black children because they don't teach them uh, about their history beyond slavery. Um, and also because they teach us uh, the one-sided uh, perspective of philosophy and English and other uh, important studies. For instance, we only learn about Socrates and um, just a lot of other white philosophers. It's one-sided because we don't also see black philosophers that uh, contributed more or are actually the key uh, founders of uh, certain principles that we, you know, that we uh, celebrate, like for instance, being kind to one another. These are all um, ideas that first originated from Africa before Buddha, uh, oh yeah, before Buddha became who he was, he didn't go to Europe and study, he went to Africa to actually study meditation, to study um, the importance of celebrating your ancestors um, and also um, alignment with the universe, nature. These are all values that come from Africa. And I think uh, we're kind of robbed of learning our true history and uh, the true knowledge of our ancestors. We're robbed of all of that because we're only taught about European philosophers. So I do believe that the American educational system fails us in that way. But I also believe that uh, we fail ourselves by not advocating more for segregation. I know that sounds backwards because in the past we advocated uh, for integration, but I do believe that now we should start advocating for at least 80, 85% segregation from um, white people so we can um, begin to build our own institutions that way we can control how much our black counterparts get paid based on what we feel they are worth. You see, when we put the um, when we put the worth of ourselves in the hands of our oppressors, that is when we set ourselves up for failure, and that is how they continue to beat us over and over. So once we finally say okay, we're done being controlled by our uh, oppressors. We're done being taught by our oppressors. That is when we can finally move forward. We don't have to deal with a failed American educational system because we create our own. So um, yeah, I mean, he points out pretty good facts, hardcore facts that we have not been treated equal by our oppressors and they continue to teach us falsely about ourselves and our ancestors and our history. Therefore, we need to be, we need to segregate ourselves. That's just my thoughts on that. That's my piece. Very intense thought and I'll just, because we want to continue with our reading and, and revisit this in the final, but, um, What's interesting is this notion of, you know, putting one's um, destiny or economic compensation, as you stated, in the hands of our oppressors. We know that in America, women are paid 66 cents on a dollar to men. And if women set the pay scale, that would not be the case, right? So we also know that, you know, historically, that, that, that's a, that when, when Brown versus the Board of Education came up, it was really about sharing resources. The notion was that the white schools received more of the taxpayer dollars than did the black schools. Had the black schools received equitable amount of taxpayer dollars under black leadership, that would have been an interesting piece. And if they had received the same amount of taxpayer dollars under black leadership with white faculty and, and staff working there and students at a predominantly black school, that also would have been an interesting experiment. So Ariel, you really um, tossed something out there for us to consider. <laughs> Dr. Harris, I don't know if you want to yeah. respond quickly I before we go back to, say to the something reading. Quickly, you know, Ariel, as you were reading, in the segregated system, it everything was segregated. When I went to Columbia, 
I was interviewed and I told them I'd never had a conversation with a white person. I was 16 when I started college in 16 years, I'd never had a conversation with a white person, but the education was so separate. The black schools didn't even take the college boards. I was the first student from my school, me and Billy Ann Burnett, the two of us took the college boards in 1960. Okay, so prior to 1960, none of the black kids who came through our education system ever took the college boards. We had to literally have, I was so afraid to take at, at we had, that was the only time I ever went into the white school because they didn't even give it in the black schools. And they segregated us and they sat us in a corner and I was afraid to go to the bathroom. Took the whole test, the whole day, never moved from my seat. And so that's how separate it was. And the last point is, when we talk about a failed education system, especially for black folks, it is a it is planned to fail. It was designed to fail. When you take teachers out who had that sincere desire to help children become better, when you look at the autobiography of Malcolm X, when he talks about when he was talking about as a child being a lawyer, they told him, no, 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 you can't be a lawyer, you're a Negro. <laughs> You know, learn to do stuff with your hands, do some mechanics. And so when we when we really see that and how even the teachers and the administration are impacted by this paradigm of slavery in painting a picture, and Ariel, you said something very powerful. When somebody else paints the picture of your place in the world, and when that person who paints that picture of you sees you as less than human is three-fifths of a human being, it is virtually impossible to get a good outcome and to have a good education, except by the will of God and the determination for our people to survive and thrive. As they say, the kidnapped African just would not great. die. Back Thank you, God. that's great. Will we continue with our reading at this time, Ariel, before we bring up Tori to begin his reading? Of course, starting at chapter three, American Religion. How does America practice its religion? If America is truly one nation under God, let us look at how America practices its religion and worships its God. The separation and segregation that exists in America today starts in the churches of America. The most segregated and separated hour in America is from 11 a.m. to noon on Sunday morning. This is the hour that most American Christians worship their God. It was this way in 1776 when the nation was founded. It was this way in 1863 when President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. It was this way when John F. Kennedy was president and the so-called Great Society was born. It was this way when Hurricane Katrina struck New Orleans. It is this way now as you read this book. If you could visit a thousand churches on any given Sunday morning, you would find that the vast majority of churches are segregated. Black Americans attend churches where virtually all members are black and white Americans attend churches where virtually all members are white. At least 95%, 950 churches would be totally segregated, either all white or all black. Only 5% or less would be churches where the membership is racially integrated to any significant degree. The words of Edmund Burke over 200 years ago gives us a unique insight into the relationship between the way one's religion is practiced and the way one's government operates. True religion is the foundation of society, the basis on which all true civil government rests and from which power derives its authority, laws, their efficacy, and both their sanction. If it is one shaken by contempt, the whole fabric cannot be stable or lasting. Edmund Burke, 1729 until 1796, English orator and statement, statesman. The segregation and separation that is perpetuated and perpetrated by the manner in which religion is practiced in America forms the basis on which our government rests. Religion is the spiritual foundation of American government. As long as white and black Americans are divided in the practice of their religion, the American government will be divided in the execution of its authority and laws. 
Let us consider why this separation of the races is so basic in the practice of religion in America. Interesting. And one of the things that uh, your professor, Dr. Victor Eno, and I studied there at Howard University is that Edmund Burke is considered the father of modern day conservatism. So when we see the religious right partnering with the um, Republican Party, for example, that is a continuation of the thought process of Edmund Burke that uh, that professor that uh, Dr. Harris brings forward. Dr. Harris, would you care to comment on that reading of um, how does America in fact practice religion? Yes, Doc. You know, religion is such a core of our society. But in the practice of our religion, because of the racist context in which America was created, many of the lynchings, there's a book called um, Without Recourse. And it talks about the fact that many of the lynchings of Black men and Black women took place on Sunday after church and were literally church events. There are pictures of little white children standing there watching Black men burning and cutting their members off and, and, and being taught that this is how you can treat a Black man. And so if the church is perpetrating that, you know, it's hard for me to resolve or, or, or resolve to how can we be in the Bible saying there is a God, there's one God, and the second commandment says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, and then go out in the yard and, and hang people. So religion has been massaged and you as a, used as a tool that what we are seeing right now in America, this present scene with so much of the religious right, right supporting basically conservative principles of segregation, of negation of the um, systemic racism, negation of institutional racism, when we see so much of that, we have to say that these are some, <laughs> this is a Christianity of hypocrisy in so many instances because religion should not be just an intellectual concept. Religion should be a way of life. And what not just white Americans, but what the colonialists, the colonial movement always used religion as a tool. When the, I think it was uh, Cook, one of the uh, English explorers came to Hawaii in the late 1700s, there were over 300,000 Hawaiians and they were primarily people of color running a very powerful and productive society. One came yes. and united all the islands and they bought the Bible, <laughs> okay? And, and say they bought the book and the book was the Bible. And within about 60 years, that, uh, that group was decimated from 300,000 to nearly 70 or 80,000 people. And a major tool was the religion. So religion has been used not as a spiritual um, foundation, but as a tool for colonialization and delivering power. Back to Interesting. You. Right before we jump to Tory, um, Ariel, would you care to respond to uh, Dr. Harris's comments about the role of religion in segregating our society before we turn it over to our divinity student to uh, continue our read? Um, I think um, my thoughts on uh, religion is the same as the educational system. Once you create your own institutions uh, for knowledge, then you can control what knowledge um, people receive and also the narrative. I think, again, the term that I used last week was uh, psychological warfare. And that applies a lot when it comes to um, religion uh, because it's our beliefs. So once someone can alter or control or dictate, you know, what you consume mentally, they can also affect your, the way you live. So 
Um, yeah, I, I think my thoughts are pretty much the same. Okay. Do, yeah. Great. And, and what's interesting, uh, Tori, is this is the mind, Dr. Harris, that um, helped to, the, or this treatment helped mm -hmm. to shape the formulation of the AME Church and the founding of the major Black denominations, Kojic, mm -hmm. National Baptist Convention, et cetera, was the treatment of Black folks inside of those other religious bodies. Care to respond to that, uh, Tori, before you jump in and read a little bit for us? No, I would, I would just piggyback off what you said. Uh, you know, the reason why, you know, those Black congregants broke off from the Methodist Episcopal Church and created the African Methodist Episcopal be because of this racism. And, you know, they were not allowed to, to have the same freedom that their white congregants have. And so uh, it is this idea of if faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, what am I hearing that's informing my faith? And if I'm living out my faith, then that means my word of God is problematic. So, so either I am not reading it or I am reading it, but I just don't care. And so that's the question we have to ask ourselves. Deep, deep. Would you begin now to read for us at the very next section, please? Yes, sir. Thank you. What color is God? If we consider Genesis chapter one, verse 26 and 27, we will gain a perspective on the racial separation that exists in American churches. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Based on the above biblical passage, it is understandable that a white Christian American would see God or the God image as a white man. This imagery is further confirmed by the depiction of Jesus, the only son of God as a blonde haired blue eyed white man. Visit any white church in America that has a depiction of God Jesus or any of the hallowed saints, you will find images of white men or white women. If one visited every white Christian church in America, today in the 21st century, there is virtually no possibility that you will find the depiction of any of the biblical figures as black people. In America, white Christians have indeed put a face and color on God, Jesus, and the saints. That color is white and that face is Caucasian. It is probably this so-called special kinship and claimed lineage with the white God that many white Americans use as justification to have dominion over black Americans. Indeed, when a white Christian minister was justifying the killing of black Americans in the coup of 1898 in Wilmington, North Carolina, he stated, here, the ruling motive is the outraged dignity of a proud dominant race calmly determined to assert its innate right to rule. Don't touch my blue eyed Jesus. Let us test and validate this observation. Suppose there was a white minister of a typical white Christian church in America with a great depiction of the crucifixion hung above the altar showing a white, blonde, blue eyed Jesus nailed to the cross. One day this white Christian minister heard about the black Madonna worshiped in some European countries and decided that if the Madonna was black, then Jesus must have been black. The concept of a non-white Jesus is set forth in Revelation chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. And in the midst of seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass as if they had burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters." Excited about this new revelation, the white minister removed the original crucifixion depiction and replaced it with an identical picture, except that Jesus was shown as a black man. On the following Sunday, the excited minister shared his new revelation that Jesus was a black man and pointed proudly up to the new depiction of Jesus' crucifixion. <laughs> I can tell you with absolute certainty that before the sun goes down that fateful Sunday, 
the excited white Christian minister would be looking for a new church. The blonde, blue-eyed Jesus would be back above the pulpit, and the black Jesus' depiction would be burning on the trash pile. This is all understandable from a white American's perspective. However, I can remember hearing of a prominent black Christian minister who learned about the black Madonna. He reasoned further that Israel is really in North Africa and that there was scripture that described Jesus with the woolly hair and burned his bronze feet. Excited about his newly discovered understanding, the black Christian minister had the white, blonde, blue-eyed Jesus that had been hanging over the altar for over 25 years, removed and replaced with an ethnically sensitive depiction of the crucifixion with the black Jesus on the cross. The following Sunday, when the excited black minister shared his new understanding and pointed up to the black Jesus on the cross, the church elders were visibly unamused. Immediately after the service, elders called a meeting with the black minister and advised him in no uncertain terms that either he put their white Jesus on the cross back above the altar, or he would have an immediate opportunity to preach to elsewhere. In other words, in the colorful language of black American church folks, let the doorknob hit you where the good Lord splits you. The acceptance by black Americans of a God and his only son, Jesus, that does not look like them was once the norm among black Christians. In the 1950s and even into the 1970s, depicting a black Jesus on the cross was a rarity in the black churches. Most black churches in some form of a white Jesus in the depictions of the crucifixion on their church fans and on their church programs. Even today in the 21st century, when you visit black Christian churches in America, finding a black Jesus and saints in the depictions of the crucifixion is still rare. What many black Christians churches have done is shown an erected cross without a figure, white or black at all. White Christian churches today in the 21st century saw Jesus as white on their depictions of the crucifixion, on their programs, on on their advertisements and literature, one must ask if God made man in his own image. And the generally accepted image of God in Jesus is that of a white man. Why would black Americans continue to worship a God and Jesus that does not look like them? In fact, why would black Christians worship a God and his son Jesus that looks like the people that have oppressed and intimidated, brutalized and enslaved them? On first glance, this looks like the great contradiction. However, as we will see later in this book in the sections on the hundred monkey phenomenon and the making of a slave, this apparent contradiction is indeed the direct result of a paradigm of slavery inflicted by white Christian Americans on black Christian Americans. We lost your sound there for that last Hey, Tori, we can't hear you on the last part, Tori. Reading right along. Uh, on the first glance, this looks like that we couldn't hear you, Tori. I'm just going to read that last part again. Okay. See if you can regain your sound. Just say something. On the first glance. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Could you read that last part again? Uh, the making of a slave, the paradigm of slavery. I got on you. First glance, yes, please. On first glance, this looks like the great contradiction. However, as we will see later in this book in the sections on the hundred monkey phenomenon and the making of a slave, this apparent contradiction is indeed the, the direct result of the paradigm of slavery inflicted by white Christian Americans on black Christian Americans. The same identity confusion was established by Dr. Kenneth Clark in his psychological demonstration and the doll experiments that formed a part of the research basis for the 1954 Brown v. Board of Topeka, Kansas, of Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas Supreme Court decision. This decision ruled that segregation in the public schools was unconstitutional. Dr. Harris, you tried to make us laugh in that one too, I see. <laughs> that tickled my funny bone. Um, <laughs> this, this notion of what color is God and the Reverend uh, coming to a new revelation, changing the image would be met with uh, froth and danger. <laughs> so uh, you tickled my funny bone on that one. You may want to uh, introduce it a new way, but that's how I received it. <laughs> well, Doc, let me tell you. On the white church, I can speculate based on experience because I have not been there, but I know every white church I've been in that has a picture of Jesus as a white Jesus. Okay. But in a black church that I attended, that actually happened. 
one of the enlightened ministers, and I won't list his name because he was a national figure. He was one of the early conscious ministers that instead of the black robes, he had the kutu can, kute, uh, kente cloth robe. Kente cloth, yes, yes. yes. And he wore the kufi. And I mean, he was like, he was taking his trip, his church to Africa a couple of times. And after I think that second trip, you know, realizing, you know, once you go to Egypt, for example, and you see the pyramids and the, the figures on the pyramids of black people. And he came back, I mean, he was fired up. He came back and he decided, he made that decision. He And you've seen there's a couple of pictures of the black Jesus, but he, uh, as a matter of fact, I believe he actually commissioned it. But anyway, he put that black Jesus up and it really happened that day after that church, the elders, the 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 uh, trustees, the, the, they got him together and they let him know that mm -hmm. that Jesus, they wanted their white Jesus back. And, and I mean, they put it like, so I said that humorously, but that's just how it happened. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget conversing with him. He said, he told me, he said, attorney, he said, I didn't think that would happen. He said, I thought that I'd taken my church to Egypt and to Israel, you know, and we'd seen it. He said, I, I just didn't think that would happen. But he had no idea how deep the paradigm of slavery and the grips of racism are on the consciousness of our people. Back to you, Doc. Very interesting. Psychologically, they say that uh, children can read images or signs before they learn to read words. So the power of images that sinks deep into our subconscious. I think most people remember the picture of um, John F. Kennedy, uh, Robert Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, John Kennedy, and Martin Luther King. And they also remember that picture of the white Jesus up. So to take that down um, as a minister, uh, Reverend Tori Haynes, and as a divinity school student, what's your response to Dr. Harris's analysis and writing? Well, I'll just say I was trying so hard not to uh, laugh because I could see it happening and, and the response and, and, and truly, while it does you know, make us laugh the way you presented it, the depths of that kind of psychological uh, no, indoctrination and how adamantly we feel about this man uh, who, we, if we read our Bibles about how he was described, would we recognize him at all? Uh, the depths of that is so deep. And, and so while in the moment we can laugh because uh, we're aware of this to those, you know, millions maybe who are not aware of this or even are aware, but says you will not take that down. You, you perpetuate this, once again, this, this, this idea that, okay, that man up there looks like, uh, you know, he, he's God, I worship God, I submit to God, I, I do whatever, God calls me to do, then, you know, this, you know, are we rebellious to anybody who does not look like him and we're submissive to anybody who looks like him? Like, like how far does this go? And I, and I, and I just echo what my sister said, Miss, Miss Payne, the only people, and I, and I'll just say this because this is who I hear from. I won't say this is the only people saying it. But the nation of Islam was the were, were the are still the the religious institution that I hear. Do for yourself, you know, you know, create your own institution. Still, go to your own institution. Separate, 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 and and so many and and, and that's such a taboo, you know, nation of Islam, such a, such a taboo word. Minister Louis Farrakhan, such a taboo name. But at the end of the day, what wisdom is coming out of that? that we could use to inform our own beliefs and our own faith journey. And so doc, that's powerful. That's powerful because while it is humorous, the depths of it is so troubling because how much longer will it last? And we have a, a Wayne Lingram who's responding. He raises the point that growing up in the state of Maryland, 
even the cemeteries were segregated as if, you know, there was a, a white man's heaven and a black man's heaven. So the notion that, you know, I, I think in, in Islamic faith traditions, they don't believe in what they call graven images. So their art does not depict human form. It actually depicts more geometric shapes and things of that nature. And I think it was Michelangelo that painted the picture of the Last Supper and what we now deem to be um, this image of Jesus as though it were fact, as opposed to the, the black child in the Madonna, that interestingly enough, I think it was in the 80s or 90s, the artist Madonna made a song and in her song, she dim she showed the black Madonna and the um, and the baby Jesus, and the the actor Leon was her counterpart in the video, and she received a lot of flack from that. Uh, the religious, you know, uh, institution I think it was the Catholic Church rose up and basically denounced her for the visual depiction of Jesus and the Christ child and and the mother Mary as anything other than, um, you know, this white as snow version. I was looking at uh, Wayne's comment. Wayne, I think throughout the South, I'm in Wilmington, North Carolina, and it's interesting, We the, the cemeteries are sec segregated and separated by a fence. <laughs> and one cemetery, of course, the Confederate cemetery, uh, was it Greenlawn? Uh, Oakdale, which was set up after the right around the civil, actually before the Civil War, and all of the people there are white. I don't think there's, there's I know there's not a single black man that's ever been buried in in Oakdale. If it does, he was definitely undercover. Okay, and you have right on the other side of the fence, you have the black cemetery, which is where my people, my family, are buried. But the interesting thing, though, they have a third cemetery which is a white cemetery, but that's poor white people. So, so it, it, it really created, you had rich, well, the landowners, the slave owners in, in Oakdale Cemetery. You have uh, the black folks and, and prominent black folks. Black folks are in one cemetery, the poor and the rich. You have the, the, the tomb there of R.R. R. Taylor, who was the first black man to graduate from MIT College in 1888. He, who designed many of the buildings at Tuskegee University. You have the prominent Black people that helped uh, forge the civil, right move, civil rights movement. And then on the other side of that Black cemetery, you have the cemetery for poor white people. And so as, as Mr. Uh, Ingram says, uh, Wayne says, he says, is there a white heaven and a Black heaven? Based on the predominant philosophy right now, the paradigm of slavery says that white people really think that there's a white heaven. And that if they went to heaven, and being comical, but if they went to heaven and there was a black administration in heaven, I believe that many of them would wanna know, is there any other place that we can go? <laughs> Interesting point, Dr. Harris, in Charlotte, there is um, a Jewish cemetery. And in the Jewish tradition, uh, they don't put flowers on their grave sites, they put stones. And that cemetery dates back to right around the end of enslavement of African-Americans to 1865 was the earliest, you know, kind of carvings I could find there. So this idea that the nation's root has so much, you know, hypocrisy and systemic racism in it that people historically have been treated differently, paid less for their labor when the two educational systems of uh, the black run schools with principals and black leadership and teachers and the white run schools with principals and leadership and teachers were put together, those black schools were literally destroyed and black people were absorbed into those other schools that you point out, that some of those principals became teachers at the white college, at the white schools. So over what, 400 plus years in America's history, we haven't really grappled in depth with the, 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 the practice of racial discrimination and the vestiges of racial discrimination 
the way you're causing us to by grappling with these issues in, in the text you've written. Uh, it's so very, very in the fabric of America, and it can only be solved on a spiritual, you know, the, the Bible has been used as a tool of conquest, religion has, uh, religion is a lot like a, a knife. It can be used to cut and kill, or it, you, or it can be used to carve and enhance. And so I think Religion really, you know, going back to Burke, you know, when, when he was saying that true religion is the foundation of our society. And so it is no puzzle why our society is fractured and divided <laughs> because our religion is fractured and divided. And if we're ever going to resolve this issue and what Ariel was saying is, you know, to pull out in a separate country. But I think what is happening now with the global economy it, it, it seems, I don't know if that's even possible anymore. We attempted that. Liberia was actually set up by freed American slaves. When you go to Liberia, everybody's named Jones and Jackson and, you know, no Kutu Kentes, okay? Because it was, you know, slaves who had left the United States to go back to, to the freedom of Africa. And it's really one of the few African nations that have never, never been conquered. But the spiritual basis, though, forms the foundation that if we're ever going to get it together in the government, because it's clear that the government can't do it. The civil law, the laws can't do it. The, the legislators can't do it. The spiritual community in the Bible, when we talked about the idea of acknowledgement, asking forgiveness and making atonement. But Dr. Harris, if we just read a section that dealt with, I'm going to use the word, the hypocrisy of the spiritual systems as is practiced in the religion of Christianity in America. And if we're going to rely on, you know, a spiritual solution, do you think that that spiritual solution is going to come out of that problematic institution as it exists? And as, you know, people have vestiture in title and land, vestiture in this is my congregation. I think of pastors like um, Hagee, you know, I think of pastors like um, not so much Billy Graham's son, although he kind of tilted that way. But I think of the the, the Christian coalition. Oh, what's the guy with the television show? Um, the television station. He ran for president at one point. Pat Robertson. And when I when I when yeah. I when I think of who right now is running the quote unquote spiritual dimension of the church the christian church in america and the white christian church in america, do you see them shifting their thinking in order to move the nation out of this momentum we have for these 400 plus years doc but you know doc the hope change takes place in the young people and that's why ariel is so important change takes place in the young people the civil rights struggle Dr. King was in his 20s when he was heading up the bus boycott. With that. But I'm hearing Ariel, I'm hearing Ariel say, uh, just, you know, I'm just listening to her, trying to respond to what I'm hearing her say. Mm -hmm. I don't think that she thinks as is that that current, nor Tory, the current practice of that faith tradition is actually going to be the key to unlocking this racism piece. And, and I don't mean to put words in her mouth, but I'm just trying to, you know, square what we're reading to what her comments and Tori's comments have been. And I would like to hear from them if we could, because we, we're running, you know, another six in. Well, let me just say one yes. thing. When you, the universe is based on choices, order, and decisions over time. And so when we look at where we are right now, one of the challenges I had with, let's just say, uh, the separatist philosophy was that the world has become so global. One of my friends had a had a, a husband who was like very much into it, and he wanted to buy black, and he was he was having. One day he got on he got on her nerves, and she said, "Do you have a telephone?" He says, "Of course." Did a black man make it? He said, "No." When they put it down, 
How'd you get here today? Yeah, drove my car. Did a black man make it? Yeah, well then leave the car. And so from a practical point of view, it's something that um, there was a time that I think that can happen, but now with the globalized economy of the global world, that everything is so interdependent now that even what the area was saying that a part of our role is as as senior warriors. <laughs> That's better. I don't want to be a senior citizen. I'm a senior warrior. Okay. But a part of our role is to help Ariel see these different things. We've seen a lot of things over the years. We've seen, we were very much involved with the Muslims during the, the heyday when the Muslims had the restaurants all over the country, when they had their own farms and they were growing their foods and they were bringing the foods to Chicago, to New York, to all the major cities. They really had a network. And over time, we saw what the structure, the business structure did to that network. Okay, through economics, through political things. So if there is another solution other than the spiritual one, I don't know what it is. Because until you can change what I believe the hundredth monkey phenomenon says that when enough people become aware of a certain truth, that that truth will penetrate the entire species. Yes, sir. So, when we look at the young people now with the Black Lives Matter movement, and we see how that movement penetrated all levels of race and, and brought together a consciousness that really, I think the, the, the past administration got fearful when they saw its ability to bring black and white, but bring young people together. I think that's why they changed up and took a different attitude toward it. And so I think our real hope is that the young people who are still open who are not so affected by this paradigm, this cancer of racism, can develop a new thought and that enough of them can develop that new thought that it hits a critical mass, that now the churches have to conform to the members, you know, the, the congregants, as you were saying, Reverend. It may be idealistic, but I don't see any other solution other than that. Back to you, Doc. Care to respond, Ariel and Tori, before we depart for today? I'll just say this. Uh, I agree with Dr. Harris, but we would have to focus on having faith and works. Because what we see is when we have faith without works, that means we proclaim a God that can save us, but we have no unity and no vision. And, and, and so if we have this faith and we have these works and we know how to organize, we know how, you know, we have, we have people who specialize in economics. We have those leaders. We have, we have young people coming up through education and who, who are excited to teach, who are penetrating and, and crossing these barriers. When we have people who are proclaiming truth and says, see, one thing I'll say is I'm a part of the United Methodist Church, which is you know, predominantly you know, white uh, denomination. Uh, but even though I'm a part of this denomination, that does not mean that I let go of my identity and who I am as a person and what I love and who I love. Who do I love? I love God's people, but more specifically, if, if, I'm, if God is a God of the oppressed and Black people are being oppressed, then, then how can I ignore that? And so Yes, I understand, you know, about the global economy, and, and although we're interdependent, it does not mean that we cannot do for self and build for self. And so, you know, it does not mean that we cannot target, uh, you know, what we create to a specific audience, uh, you know, and, and, and I'll end with this. There have been a lot of recent attacks on Asian Americans, uh, you know, throughout the country. And, 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 Yesterday, two Asian Americans came together and said, "Listen, we're going to raise some money. We're going to we're going to put out a reward um, for for information. Uh, I don't know, see what's going on." And and that idea, or you know that that kind of example, has to be the same for Black people. When we see a problem or we identify the issue that is going on, we have to immediately come together and says, "This is the solution. Let's let's move forward." Let's let's go. You know, if there if it is a spiritual solution, 
let's start working. You know, we can't continue to have conferences, preach, hoop and holler, dance, miracles, miracles, miracles. And then we're still suffering and, and, and are an oppressed people at the end of the day. Thank you for that. Ariel, would you care to respond as we prepare to exit with uh, Dr. Harris's closing comments? Um, I think it was, that was a great way to uh, end us off. Uh, I do want to say that I agree that now we are uh, interdependent among each other, but that's why I would say not 100% segregation, but like at least 80, just because we would still want to trade and uh, converse with uh, non-Black people. But at the end of the day, we would want to depend on ourselves. So by segregation, I don't mean uh, go to a different country and cut off all communication from uh, America, because at the end of the day, we are still labeled African Americans. Uh, however, I do think that uh, separating ourselves and becoming dependent on ourselves is the best. And I know that's hard because um, right now, like you said, we depend on each other, other countries, other parts of the country or whatever for resources. However, I think we, we have to start trusting ourselves. And I believe that that is the answer just because of their response in the past when we've uh, done that. Like, um, uh, is it um, Rosewood? For instance, Rosewood. Rosewood, there's Greenwood, you know, the Tulsa, Oklahoma. Yes, those, those communities. The Tulsa, Oklahoma massacre, yes. That was mentioned in the book uh, earlier in earlier chapters. So I think just from their reaction to us creating our own institutions and relying on ourselves, I think it's the answer. Okay. And so, and, and so thank you so much for your... Uh, Ariel Payne and the Reverend Tori Hayes. We really appreciate you, Dr. Harris, as we uh, have reached our, our timeline. Would you care to close us out before we reconvene tomorrow I said, I with two additional well. readers? I said, well, and let me tell you, thank you so much, Ariel and Brother Payne, Brother Payne, Ariel Payne and Brother Hayes. <laughs> I thank you so much because you all have shared so much insight and I'd like to put a thought out there. You know, every other ethnic group, we have to look more at our ethnicity. That may be the separation that we're talking about, not necessarily physical or ethnicity. So you have the Hispanics come here to the point where now they, it's called Latinos or Latinas. You have different, but you have people who come from Hispanic speaking countries come here. They use their ethnicity as that bond. So they're still within America, but they are tightly bound. A part of the slave lesson was to teach Black Americans to never come together. It was illegal for us to come together. And so maybe this, this do for self, and, and the Mexicans, the Hispanic, every other group, the, uh, the Italians, you know, every other group, when they come, they still maintain that, that cultural and that, that ethnic identity. And because we were slaves and because we were taken away from our ethnic identity, we it's important to reconnect with that. Uh, uh, someone just said we should have dual citizenship with Africa. That may be a good thought, but we must reconnect with our roots so that we can, that separation is more now of an, an ethnic concept. And so one, one, I was at a conference and someone said that America is like a melting pot. But as I really thought about it, America is like a salad. A great salad has cucumbers and lettuce and carrots and all those things. And each of us is like a cucumber or that each ethnic group is a part of that salad. We retain our own identity, our ethnic culture, but we are still a part of in, and integrated in to that salad that makes the meal that is America a great meal and a great dinner. Thank you so much for joining us today. I have, I tell you folks, I have enjoyed this. All of our, our all of our um, recordings, our daily readings are posted on our website. 
www.solvingtheraceissue.com. We're putting them up almost the next day. And share this website, share our link, uh, www.thebigread.net, www.thebigread.net and invite other people to attend. And remember this, that we're gonna put all this together in one of the most powerful audio and video groupings that has ever been done. So thank you so much for being a part. Tomorrow, thank one o'clock. Thank you everyone, see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.